Welcome back to Building Tomorrow, a show that is, among other things, about cool new tech and innovations that could drastically change our daily lives in the near future. I'm your regular host, Paul Matsko, and there's no better place to get a sneak peek into the near future than at TechCrunch Disrupt, an annual conference in San Francisco that I attended the first week of September. There are other major tech conferences, of course. Uh, MIT does a really cool one with uh, kind of tech in the medium term horizon. But what sets TechCrunch apart is that the goal of the conference is to match up Silicon Valley investment firms with tech startups, which means that much of the tech on display is very close to being ready for mass market. So as I talk about some of the interesting startups I saw and uh, some of the founders I spoke to in San Francisco, I'm not just talking about hypothetical, distant future applications of technology. This is stuff for which there's a high probability that you'll see the tech implemented in a grocery store, on a road, or even in your ear uh, over the next year or two. Uh, Now, this is a departure from our usual format for Building Tomorrow episodes. I recorded these interviews with startup founders in person on the floor of the Startup Alley Exhibition Hall, so you'll hear more background noise than usual. But I hope you get from that a taste of how exciting it is to go to a conference like TechCrunch. Each of the next three episodes features one or two interviews with a startup founder and is organized around a different theme or cluster of technology. Now, one good sign that the tech is nearly ready for mass adoption is when multiple startups are competing in the same space and attempting slightly different solutions to a similar problem. Our theme for today is job automation. The robots are coming. Well, they're already here, of course, as anybody who works in manufacturing will tell you. But whereas the wave of robotization in the 1980s, 90s, and aughts primarily displaced blue-collar jobs in manufacturing-based industries, this next wave is coming for folks with traditionally white-collar jobs that we thought were immune from displacement. Uh, And instead of robots, this next wave of automation is going to be a function of artificial intelligences. A robot can build things more quickly and precisely than a human ever could, but an AI can think through things more quickly and precisely than a human can. Now, our first interview is with the founder of a startup that is applying AI technology to the drudge work previously done by young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed lawyers fresh out of law school uh, who spend many, 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 many hours engaged in document review, which is the bane of, of their existence. Uh, So listen in. I'm standing here with Nick Whitehouse, who's the co-founder of McCarthy Finch, uh, which is coming to take your legal job away from you. Future lawyers. Oh, no. (laughs) The uh, automation apocalypse is upon us. Tell tell me why that's not true, Nick. Hi, Paul. Um, It's it's not true because I think AI isn't at this point where it's this major threat to us as as people. Um, I think it's it's much more in the augmentation space. And so what we've found is you're always going to need a lawyer. I uh, give the example of Brexit. I give the example of um, privacy in the United States at the moment. And law is an incredibly topical um, subject in America at the moment. Um, I don't think you can go to any newspaper without seeing something about the law on the front page. Um, and these are, these are really, really complex situations that are really perfect for people. Uh, based on the relationships that they have, based on the really creative thinking that they have to go into to navigate through laws. But where AI plays a really big part is in that the drudgery, the, the work that is really, really repetitive that we don't, we don't as consumers of law, don't necessarily value. Um, and that, that also goes for in business. It's massively big um, in business in the sense that, that all of these changes is, have really pushed the pace of business further, uh, faster, 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 and the risk appetite of business has re- dramatically changed because of that. And so the value that they place on this mundane so- sort of legal stuff um, has decreased. And so where AI plays that part is, is picking that up and really helping lawyers get through that quicker um, and focus on valuable things. So I think it's a really complementary um, approach uh, and, and a complementary future at the moment for lawyers and AI. So now, just for nitty gritty, for those of our listeners who don't know about the world of document review, this is, uh, I guess, if if you've ever seen an episode of Better Call Saul, 
and they're down in like a, a windowless basement oh, yeah. room. And there's the, behind, behind the nail salon. Yeah, behind the nail salon, there's boxes of boxes of documents that they, you know, you're fresh out of law school, you get hired by a big law firm, and you just spend hours and hours and hours for your first couple of years combing through basic legal documents, looking for errors in wording, a missing clause here, a missing you know article in the contract. And it has to be done, but it's incredibly boring and tedious work. Um, is that what you're kind of focusing on at McCarthy Finch to try to replace that work with? Yeah, I, I think I think it's it's a little bit broader. But okay. so in that scenario, yeah, discovery and, and litigation is massive. It's really hard work. Um, uh, if you're a junior lawyer, you're coming into law firms and and you're not trusted. You're not you're not able to do stuff and be creative. You're, you're told to. Um, do research, you're told to find things, you're told to print things, and you, you know, you're charged out for that. But as a, as a human, you don't necessarily understand how you fit into that process, and you don't necessarily learn that fast either, because it's not an environment to learn in. Um, where we see McCarthy Finch playing a role is, we kind of, we, we're virtualizing that lawyer um, with cognitive services, and that goes right across from a law firm to an in-house team, through to consumers, through different legal tech providers, to take those repetitive, tr- highly transactional legal tasks and apply AI to that so that they happen fast, instantaneous. And the examples you know, we, we showed on um, Battlefield stage, we, we completed a, a, a contract approval in under two minutes. Uh, when we gave that to lawyers to do, it took them 75 minutes just to read the contract, not to go through all the different points. And so you, you can understand how that's a massive shift in kind of how you would actually approach transactional legal services. As a client, um, I don't, I just want the outcome, right? I, and I need the outcome as fast as I possibly can, as cheaply as I, as, as cost efficiently as I possibly can. Um, and this is a real paradigm shift for me as a consumer of law. Mm. So is this in part a tool meant your lawyer's office, this is a complementary tool that you can you know, you can pay for that will allow you to move through this material more quickly. So if you're, I don't know, a real estate attorney and you're used to combing through this you know, real estate contract, you can, but it, it'll take you an hour or two hours. You can, you know, put it through the system. It'll spit out, here's areas you should maybe review more closely. Here's some conflicts you need to resolve. It'll speed up your workflow, meaning you're spending less time per document which in theory will lead to cost savings that you can pass on to consumers as well. Yeah, and so I think at a base level, that's where people are focusing on, is reducing costs. I'm not a big believer in commoditizing services. I think I'm a big believer in creating value. And so, yeah, we can absolutely do that. But I think about health care. When I think about how do you how do you disrupt an industry? And, and I look at healthcare, and you know, wouldn't it be great if you and I, if we have a health problem, can self-diagnose and heal ourselves, right? That's like that. That's utopia. And when I look at law, that's the same sort of thing, right? And a law firm shouldn't feel like they're uh, excluded from that, or a lawyer shouldn't feel like they're excluded from that. What a lawyer does is transfer their expertise, transfer their knowledge to you as a consumer of that. At the moment, they do that through billable hours predominantly, and everything is in it has to be inefficient because that's how they get their money. Um, but if they can provide services, I mean, we have a service called Author, right? They can create, they can take that author service and they can sell that and they can transfer that expertise and enable you to do what you need to do without having to play a part. But it's a service, they're still transferring their expertise. A completely new way of serving clients. So if that's in conversational um, AI, that you can go to on a website, if it's built into your contract so you can ask your contract a question without having to go to the lawyer. Doing all of that sort of stuff is an amazing new experience for clients that, that, you, that clients value yeah. because you're getting what you want out of it and, and a lawyer is still transferring their expertise. It's just a different way of doing it. And I think that's, that's where you create value. That's where you drive, um, I, I guess, much more empowerment of the consumers of law and I think that's a really good thing. The more we're empowered to consume law, the more we'll protect our rights and the more we'll want to consume law more because ultimately you're being pulled into to understand there's a value and benefit of doing it. So let's say I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm just an ordinary consumer 
I'm looking for a will. I want to write a will. You know, I'm, I'm starting to realize, oh, I don't have anything in place in case my myself or my partner dies. Someone has to take care, look after the kids. How would this software make it easier for me to to interact with with a lawyer's legal expertise? To ease that process. Like, how does this look on the ground? Yeah. So on the on the ground, I think Will's a really good example because when when you talk to anybody who is just a consumer of legal services. You go to a lawyer three times in your life. When you get married, when you, you when you got a will, and when you're buying a property, right? Yeah. Or maybe when you die as well. But you're not going to the lawyer <laughs> at that point. That. <laughs> um, and so the, the, from the will perspective, um, it is really about taking... Uh, that. That's very much a conversational AI approach, right? Understanding all those really complex different ways that a will could best suit you and allowing the AI to do the interaction to find those concepts and connect you to the right things that should be in a will. And so where we see our product helping in that space is with those providers who are providing those services around wills. And that could be a legal zoom or a, or a rocket lawyer. That could be um, the local, the local um, legal office or it could be another legal tech product that comes out. But really shifting that focus. Absolutely the lawyer needs to be involved in this at some point. But there's a whole bunch of work that you don't have to pay $400 an hour to do to, to, to inform them to, make, to help make that will better for you. And I think that's where the real power is, is that you can go on and you, uh, on that journey in your own time, at your own pace, to understand what options are available to you. To be informed that so when you are paying $400, $500 an hour for a lawyer, you're getting the best value out of that time. Well, in theory, I can imagine this should increase the pool of people who right now are intimidated by the prospect. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, it's, I'm in my mid-30s, I'm starting to think about this. I mean, I mean this literally, not just (laughs) metaphorically. I have a will in place. Um, I should have one, but do I want to go talk to a lawyer and go to an office and pay lots of money? But if there was a a way for me to, to start exploring the options, that could then later be validated by an actual attorney. Well, that that expand. You know, there, there are people who want legal services but find that barrier intimidating or too expensive or just for whatever reason they're yeah. not taking that plunge. Absolutely, we should expand that pool, right? Yeah, and so when you when you look at the numbers, uh, America spends about four hundred and thirty-seven billion dollars on legal services a year. Forty-nine percent of the global's legal spend is in America. <laughs> wow. When you yeah. when you we've done market research. When we go to consumers of law. Um, we see that 88% of people would rather go to Google or talk to a friend than ever go to a lawyer if they have a legal problem. Not just exploring. No, I have yeah. a legal problem. I don't want to go to a lawyer. <laughs> trust Google instead, right? yeah. <laughs> people people to often find law as expensive, intimidating, and really, really kind of slow. And, and that's one of the things that we see. And by augmenting lawyers, you actually create, you scale the legal services. And I've, I, as, as a consumer of law, have experienced this. I've... I bought a house, had a terrible experience with my lawyer, hated it. They they were really, really slow. I had to chase them up for settlement. It was like a really bad experience. And I walked away from that thinking, what's the point of a lawyer? I pay $1,000 an hour for somebody to do what? Um, And then I I bought my next property, and that was with, um, not that I'm a really rich guy or anything, (laughs) but hey, New Zealand Zealand residential market's great. Um, But... When I went when I went in that down that path, I went with a, uh, the law firm that I was working with at the time, and the experience was entirely different. Um, they negotiated the contract for me really hard. I got a bunch of stuff in that that I just didn't think was possible, and and that was where I, f- I found that the real value was. It wasn't the reading of the contract. It was understanding what I wanted and then going into battle for me to get what I wanted. And that is where the value of a lawyer really lies. It's that negotiation. And if I can consume and understand and be empowered and then know what I should be getting from my lawyer and what, you know, where a lawyer plays and really serves me with value, that's an entirely different buying experience that I think actually brings lawyers back into relevance in everyday life. It'd be like imagine if in healthcare we required doctors to do everything that takes place in the doctor's office. They had to do the blood draws. They had to uh, fill out the paperwork. They had to, well, that, that would be a crazy way of constructing a system because what makes a doctor valuable is the specialized expert service they provide, which is diagnosing what's wrong with the patient, right? And that yeah. 
takes a lot of training on that. It would be wasted if we made them do something that could be done by someone else just as, if not more effectively. Oh, absolutely. Same thing kind of in law. Like, what, why should we be having people go through three years of training, you know, internships, et cetera, just to read documents that could be done by an AI more, more quickly, more effectively, and allow lawyers to spend their time on the real value-added service. Yeah, and, and I mean, when was the last time you went to a doctor and you hadn't gone to WebMD and figured out what was wrong with you before <laughs> you went right, yeah. to the doctor? And, and, I mean, over the last 15, 20 years, we've all become far more empowered when seeing medical professionals, right? Um, we're not empowered to see lawyers. And you're absolutely right. You've got these incredibly smart people. And they are very, very smart people who come out of law schools and go into law firms. And some of them do move up fast, but, but they are not give, they're not necessarily given the hard tasks. And we pay a lot of money for them. Um, and so, we, you know, we've talked a lot about the consumer side of things. Um, and we, we, we definitely are working with legal tech providers to, to change that space. Um, but we're also working with the businesses, and those businesses um, have just as many of these problems, if not more, um, trying to navigate that space as well. And that's a big cost to us as um, a cost in different ways. One is obviously cost of regulation, all that does get passed on to us as consumers. But risk and, and fear slows down innovation, slows down how quickly products get to market, slows down businesses in general. And so there's this kind of malaise that you can cut through by creating clarity and getting through the, the mundane legal stuff so that lawyers can focus on being creative and actually moving these businesses forward quickly as well. Now, have you gotten any pushback from, or any, or I guess, any reaction at all from, like, the American Bar Association or any of the, you know... No, no, no. And we, 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 we play in a specific space. So we don't believe that the AI should be giving legal advice. We believe it should be empowering people, um, much like Google would, but in a, in a much smarter and more specific way. And so um, uh, from the legal, the legal side of this, st- this stuff, we, we talk about augmentation. We don't talk about replacement of lawyers. In no way would I ever advocate that people should go down the path of, when they have a legal problem, just relying on um, an AI. I, I, AI is not at that point. Um, you should definitely always, if you believe you have a problem, seek advice from an actual lawyer um, but we ho- we, what we aim to do is empower people through that process yeah. you're kind of the web MD of the legal profession yeah, is, is absolutely. Kind of cool. not a replacement but an augmentation that, yeah absolutely yeah. so you, you as a consumer are empowered so that you're, you're not spending your money unwisely so you're sp- you, know, you spend your money on the right things you're getting the right results and you know what you should be pushing for so you come from New Zealand uh, how did you end up you know, in this place, in in the U.S., with a you know with a startup in Silicon Valley, like how, how this happened for you, Nick? Yeah, so it's been a really fun journey. So um, I was a chief digital officer of a very large law firm in Australasia, in New Zealand, the New Zealand arm, about three thousand lawyers in the legal group. Um, so between Australia and myself, we we had um, teams, and and I was tasked with looking at innovation um, from the New Zealand perspective. And we looked at both sustaining and disruptive innovations, and this really was an idea that came out of this disruptive innovation phase. How how do you serve the world differently in law? Um, and so that ended up, I was on an innovation mission to Silicon Wadi in, in, in Israel, and I met a couple of people who were actually from New Zealand, who were like, this sounds a really cool idea. Why the hell is a law firm sending somebody to think about innovation? Um, and so we actually ended up uh, meeting with a VC and... and um, to the, to the law firm and the VC invested and we found a bunch of PhDs and actually I've been traveling the world for the last year talking to large law firms, talking to consumers, talking to large businesses, legal tech providers, really understanding the market and um, the reason we're in the US is because uh, from a U- US is an incredibly innov- innovative place as I said it's 49% of the world's legal spend it's, in a highly li- it's the most litigious space in the world um, and I think there's a real need here um, with the cultural trait of innovation and trying new things and taking risks. Um, and so it's perfect for us to be here. Yes. American litigiousness for the yeah. win. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, that's great. Well, thanks for taking the time to talk to me, Nick. I, I appreciate it. I think our listeners will enjoy hearing what McCarthy Finch is doing. And we'll be sure to put a link to, to y'all's awesome. website uh, in our show notes. All right. Great. 
While Nick says that McCarthy Finch's goal isn't to replace lawyers with artificial intelligences, uh, rather they want to provide lawyers with an additional tool for their legal toolbox, the net effect of this tech, if it works well, will be to depress the hiring rate for new lawyers. However, even the smartest AIs aren't anywhere near capable of replacing the entire legal profession. Much of what lawyers do is customer service and human relations. The human-facing side of the profession, dealing with the unique demands of clients and persuading recalcitrant juries, that can't be automated, or at least not anytime soon. That work is safe, which means that established lawyers with dense relational networks between clients and other attorneys, they're not going to be hurt by this new tech. Indeed, if anything, they'll be helped since it gives them a tool to lower labor costs at their firms and cut some of the drudgery out of their own work routines. Who this tech potentially harms the most are those currently in or freshly out of or at least even considering going into law school. Imagine that you've spent three years in law school, accumulated, say, $200,000 of debt. You go on the job market and you can't even find an entry-level position at a major law firm because they're only hiring a fraction of the new JDs to do the basic document review that they used to. You hunt, you hunt, you hunt. Finally, you have to settle for something temporary in an adjacent job field. It pays a fraction of what your legal job would. It doesn't have really the same future career or career earning potential. Given that your student loan debt is, thanks to the George W. Bush administration, not dischargeable in bankruptcy, it's going to follow you the rest of your life. You can just barely meet the basic interest payments. You may never pay off those loans in your lifetime. And so this basic career miscalculation as to the future supply and demand of legal labor impacts how soon you'll be able to afford a home, how many kids you can afford to have, whether you can afford to take any financial risks to start a new business or to move to a new region, and how soon you can retire. But what if you could avoid that fate, if there was a better way of assessing the risk that the career you are considering will be automated in the next five years or so? That's the promise of our next startup interview. Listen in. I'm here with a VC who's the founder of a startup called SixFigure.com. And uh, we're going to talk here about uh, a new trend. I mean, it's actually a a website and a program that helps deal with something that's an increasing issue here over the next decade, which is white collar job loss, uh, jobs like uh, analysts and lawyers and uh, uh, even even some doctor or medical related fields are being taken by uh, AI. I mean, they're, they're being automated, they're being um, routinized uh, in, in the modern economy, which means job loss for people who are previously thought they had a job guarantee lined up for them for the rest of their careers. Um, and Six Figure is designed to help mitigate some of that problem, to help catch it earlier for students. So, VC, why don't you explain a little bit about your website for our listeners and, uh, you know, uh, describe how the system works. Right. So, uh, thanks for having me. At uh, Six Figure, we, uh, work on, we work on future of work that is... Uh, an Oxford study said 47% of the jobs, existing white-collar jobs, are going to be taken over by AI by 2024, and it's coming in. So uh, what, what, we had, what we help with the uh, users is any person who uh, logs into our website, he knows what is the, we calculate what is the job risk associated with any title, and then we say what are the skills you should be learning to make a transition to a safe zone where the person will still be employed. Right, right. So, uh, and what are the variables which we use in calculating the risk associated with the job is to find out whether the job involves uh, negotiation, persuasion, is there a finger dexterity, is there a creative uh, intelligence to it or a social intelligence to it. So, on a research back study, we are able to find out what are the, jo- what are the jobs that are at high risk and what are the skills you should be learning to move to a low risk jobs and still be employed. For example, when you're talking about, we might think like, okay, the lawyers and the doctors, they were like, the automation is only coming in tech, but that's not true. The automation is coming even uh, for something as complicated as medical, and the automation risk for the, for the radiologist is like 98%. 98% of the jobs are not going to be there for the radiologist. 
Imagine people are paying 500k to go get a medical degree and they're spending 10 years yeah. and at the end of it there's not going to be a job. Yeah. Or there's not going to be a job which is going to pay as much in which they can recover whatever the investment which has been made. Yeah. You've so, got six figures of debt now and there's no job at the end because instead of a radiologist looking at a, a cancer scan or you know now uh, an AI can identify whether that's a tumor or a cancer just as effectively and a whole lot more cheaply for the hospital, right? Exactly. So uh, what the radiologist is doing is nothing but a image recognition problem. And there's a ton of data out there. The hospitals are opening up the data and there's open source of the data. And it's a, it's a, it's a computer science problem. And, and, once, and, and the automation is going to come after the jobs which are very, very highly, highly paid. Yeah. A radiologist gets paid somewhere on like 300 to 500K. So an employer or the hospital will be like, uh, okay, I'm going <laughs> right. to just use this automation technology yeah. and I'm going to save like 300K, right? Oh, thank mm-hmm. you. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the range of fields is quite fascinating. I mean, we've touched a few of them. There's, you know, uh, fresh out of law school graduates doing document review. Well, there's, a, an, again, an AI, there was actually a presentation here at TechCrunch Disrupt uh, that was going to automate document review. Um, radiologists, uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, uh, I think one of the examples you showed on your system to me was a uh, financial analyst yes. or credit analyst. Again, that's a, it's a data crunching kind right. of story. And it doesn't require necessarily, especially if you're a radiologist looking at, a, looking at an x-ray or looking at some data or a credit analyst looking at numbers, you're not actually interacting with a person, which requires a level of social intelligence that's a lot. That's kind of a bulwark against um, automation for now, at least, or at least during our lifetimes. Um, so those are fields that are really uh, vulnerable. So, where do you see six figure being used? Like, like who's who's paying for this service? Right. So uh, we part. The one thing we want to get it clear is the employer is not going to care about your job loss. Right. Right. Yeah. Right? So the employers do not pay for this. Who pays for this is the schools. So we partner with the schools to say like, okay, these are the these are the job titles which is not going to be there, and these are the job titles which is possibly going to exist, and how you should be designing your curriculum, what are the courses you should be teaching, and to uh, help schools think about what is what is that they should be teaching to the students, and for the students to uh, democratize opportunities. So uh, if you look at right now, we all pursue career paths which are known to us which is very limited to our friends and family like what is the path which they uh, have gone through and we try to retrace the path but that's very limiting so that's why we plug in our big data engine in which we say what is the best possible move given the choices I've made till date what is the best possible move from here and you can visualize your career career is like a 40 year marathon so you can visualize it like a chess game and look at what is my end game and and make moves according to it. Yeah. And we calculate in terms of odds and seeing like, okay, this is a dead end job. If you go here, you can never move out to any of the other jobs. And we really look at like, how can you make the moves in which your opportunities are wide, or you can transition better, or you can be in titles which is not going to be automated. Yeah. Now and that's relying on I think your database of career changes that professionals have made in the last couple of years. Is that where you're getting that you know, that transition information from? Right, so the data is actually for the last 12 years, the data. Okay. So we have been live for the last two years, but we also partner with uh, job sites who also provide us with the data. And using the data, we add the intelligence on top of it. Ah, okay. So, I mean, you know, what for whatever reason, people had to make a job transition. I mean, maybe 12 years ago, they were moving from radiologist to something else for, well, who knows why. So it doesn't really matter why they're moving. It's what they were able to most easily move to, like those alternate career paths. And I, I think that's that's interesting. I mean, I can see the, the use case for a, like a career advising office or a professional advising office. I mean, as it happens, my partner works in the health professions advising office. And this is the sort of information that would be, it's a tool kind of in the, in the toolbox that would be useful for those offices. Right. What we also take into consideration is when you're making the career transition, we also take into account, does it pay as much as ah. income, as much as the salary which you are getting before? Right, right. So uh, that, is, that is an important aspect of it in which we are not suggesting career paths where you'll still remain employed, which is far lesser. Yeah. 
right? So often, the, you know, that comes into the ego of the person of like, oh, I was pay, getting paid 300k. The, yeah. I, I don't want to transition to a job which is like 120k sure. in which I'll just be employed. Sure. Yeah. So that's why we plug in of saying that, okay, th here are the real transitions which people have made, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And we also try to connect like, who's that person? Can he refer to you and, you know, yeah. pull you out of that uh, abyss? So. so how about we plug one in and see how it, how it works? Um, uh, let's see, what, what profession should we choose? I mean, we, we did an analyst before, and we could look at that. So you plug in analyst. It gives a little job description here of what an analyst does, prepares reports with credit information, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then as you scroll down, it gives a job risk uh, number, which is, what is that there? It's a probability of AI taking over this job title. In the next six years. And sorry, analysts, uh, your risk is 98%. Does that mean 98% of the jobs or 98% likelihood that your job will be gone? 98% of your job will be oh, gone. Oh, your job being gone. Okay. So that's you got a 2% chance of keeping this uh, six years from now. So maybe it's time to make a career change. Oh, no. What do I do? I am uh, doomed. It tells me I'm doomed in no uncertain terms. Uh, I like that. Automation risk, doomed. Uh, then, okay, what was your median salary before as an analyst? Uh, $82,000 almost a year. Uh, safe designation switches. So it gives some suggested career options that are relatively similar, require relatively similar career sets uh, or skill sets, but have a much lower risk. So number one here is account manager in sales. That's because the sales engineers involves uh, social aspect of it, uh, involves yeah. uh, persuasion, right? It involves negotiation. So yeah. these are the ones where the AI is still not good. Right, right. And so it your odds... It come in the next 50 years. But yeah, right but that's, now, that's a, yeah. by then you're retired, so right. it doesn't matter. And there, your odds of losing your job in the next six years to automation is 0.41%. So phew, now you're safe. Now you're safe. Now you're very, very safe. Yeah. For your lifetime, you're safe. You don't have to worry about it. Right, right. right. A career is 40 years, so no automation. Yeah, that's great. I mean, if you know that in advance as a student... You're not having all the, the transition costs of, you know, it helps you tailor what you're doing, the internships you're taking, uh, the, the initial jobs you accept. All of that then can be tailored because of, of this kind of prediction right. engine. So one other thing, aspect which I wanted to highlight about is uh, because we are taking the analogy of a chess game, in the chess, as soon as you're able to seize the middle, your opportunity, your chances of winning goes very high. Right, right. So that's what we try to do even with like the careers of saying like which is that company or which is the job title where you, where you should be transitioning as soon as possible so that your opportunities are unlimited. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's just fascinating. Uh, VC, we want to thank you for coming on and telling our listeners about Six Figure. Uh, we'll put a link to, to, uh, to the website in our, uh, in our show notes uh, when we air this. So thank you so much sure. for your time. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. I appreciate VC's attitude. He combines a realistic sense of inevitability about the coming wave of white-collar automation with an optimistic sense that he and his company can help lessen the pain and suffering of that transition. Indeed, that's very much the spirit of TechCrunch Disrupt as a whole. Disruption is there. It's built right into the name, of course. But it's inspiring being around the very bright, very competent people who are rolling up their sleeves and trying to solve social problems and make human lives better. And they're doing so without having to appeal to government to do it for them. I mean, there was no talk of here's why we need $100 million in job retraining funds to transfer people from one career to another. No, these are people who are anticipating in advance that there will be a social problem. There will be an economic dislocation and are doing something now to try to fix that or to try to mitigate that damage. And they're doing so through private means with private funds and trying to do so to turn a profit, to, to make a career and a, a living for themselves. And so I think it's a, it's a lesson about the power of the private sector, the power of free enterprise uh, in addressing and anticipating future crises. And that's all for this episode. Tune in next week for the next in our series of interviews from TechCrunch Disrupt. Until then, be well. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.